You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. So if you know me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon, today I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of Echo Flynn's Path. So y'all, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Alarm Chan, you were up, and let's go. All right. <clears throat> Look, all you gotta do when you're trying to attach the camera to the tripod is slide it in the existing grooves. Right here. I point to the two beveled edges on the base. Then bring it in from the backside and... Dude, I just don't think I'm up for this right now. He's looking back toward my car. His paws, his paws in his pockets. Ugh, fine. I got this, I guess. Yeah, I just get in the way. <laughs> I give Carl a look. I know he's not obligated to help or anything, but Jesus Christ. He dips his head, trudging his way back toward the car. With a sigh, I start setting up the remaining equipment myself. It takes me about 15 minutes to get it all put together in the color white balance, and the color white, bal white balanced. Even still, the gravel parking lot makes it difficult to adequately line up my shot. Everything ends up looking slightly crooked. I know I can probably fix it all in post, but that's more work for me than I'm not, and that I'm not looking forward to. Carl, meanwhile, has his eyes glued to his phone. Looks like he's found a pair of earbuds because he's got he's got those in too. Be focusing. I take stock of the footage I've got from my, from here so far. The midday sun means that my recordings are all pretty much well lit, but I can't help but think that a sunset would be more symbolic. Maybe I'll come back later, I don't know. A phone vibrates in my shorts. Grabbing it, I see I've got a new message from Leo. With Jenna and TJ playing football. I'm assuming he means soccer, but I decide now isn't the time to press him on word choice. Sounds fun, filming with Carl and Flynn here. I slide my phone in my pocket, unlocking the trunk of my car so that I can start putting away all this equipment. After closing the trunk, I realize now that Flynn's standing at the city hall entry with his arms crossed, staring fur, staring furrowbrowed at my vehicle. Why the fuck is Carl here just sitting in the car? I throw up my arms and shrug. Damn his eyes! He's fucking stoned off his rocker, ain't he? Flynn is squinting in the window at the ram, who seems to barely acknowledge his presence. He ate too much of an edible this morning, apparently. Flynn looks to me, then back to Carl. Probably for the best he's staying in the car, then. Come on. He turns, heading back inside. I follow, catching a glimpse of Carl sinking down in his seat. Flynn leads me through the narrow hallways, the ceiling laden with visible old piping and the walls covered in dents and scratches. Eventually, we turn into a colorful room that looks like a mix between an old post office and a kindergarten classroom. Alright, like I said, archive files are in the back along the south wall. The computer in the corner is logged into the country's, into the country's GIS viewer. Maps and shit, basically. He points to a cream-colored computer that must be from around the early 2000s by the look of the make. Dust visible on top of the tower. Oh, so like, where the native burial grounds and that sort of thing are? Flynn crosses his arms, looking back down at me. Yeah, no. As far as I know, the Maceto tribal government hasn't put forth any sacred site claims within miles of Echo. Wow, really? Really. Why's that? I don't have a whiff of shit's worth of a clue or care. Go ask Jenna if you want to be all weird about it. I don't think she has much ties to her tribe. Yeah, well, it doesn't stop her from being a bitch about it whenever she sees fit. Flynn sucks in his cheek as if he's saying, if he's saying that left as if saying that left a bit of an unpleasant taste in his mouth. Flynn speaking less than kindly towards folks isn't anything new, but not usually about Jenna. He looks down at some papers in his hand as if they suddenly were, were very interesting. Is this about what she said when you got Carl the lighter from the reservation? His slitted eyes flick back up to me. His lips thinned. You thought that was bullshit too, right? Well, I think she was she was just still in, I don't know, den mother mode with regards to TJ after what you did. If you wanna if you wanna get everyone talking again, you need to, you should just apologize. Oh, what is happening? There's a pause in the conversation as a cloud as a cloud cover shades the light coming in from the window. It's not just about the lighter crap. She doesn't give a shit about me, and she really doesn't give a shit about Sydney. I blink. I'm still amazed at how much his name is being mentioned after all these years of silence on the subject, especially from Flynn. Catches my expression and grunts, the gale resting the side of his hip against the sorting counter. When he died, all she fussed about was was how it affected TJ. Sid could rot for all she cared. It's not fair. We were kids, and people react to that sort of traumatic stuff differently. Maybe helping TJ is what kept her occupied. Oh yeah? Remember for remember a few months before it happened when all that shit was going on with Sid's dad? And fucking Jenna. All she did was try to shield TJ from all the negativity in the situation. She tried to help, but he was different. I don't know. Fuck, we were just kids. No, she fucking hated Sydney. Carl hated Sydney. Leo hated Sydney. TJ would never fucking admit it, but he hated Sydney. Oh, one second, y'all. Water time.
And that is the last of the water. And you. You hated Sydney. He looks me in the eyes now. I'm quiet for a moment, trying to think of what to say. Flynn immediately just looks, unex well, just looks expectant, seemingly waiting for me to blanch and try to defend myself. Sydney was an asshole. He raises his chin some, his crossed arms seeming to squeeze more tightly over his chest. Yeah, so am I. No, not like him. Nobody knew him like I did. You've said that, but that doesn't mean the crap he pulled on us on TJ was in any way justified. I'm pretty sure he genuinely enjoyed watching people get hurt. Flynn stares slack jawed before quickly gritting his teeth. He liked wrestling. He liked pirates. He liked pulpy adventures and shit. But he did not like hurting people. TJ cried every day no matter what. He could see a dead fly on the windowsill and start bawling. And you all would drop everything and come rushing to his aid, scorning the shit out of anybody who didn't. We couldn't make jokes, we couldn't tease each other, we couldn't roughhouse, and we couldn't even fucking swear without TJ getting upset. It isn't like we could just hang out with someone else. This is Echo, and Leo was, is, fucking dead set on keeping the group together. But now the group for Leo essentially consists of two members. Your ass and his cock. I frown deeply. Before I can interject, he continues. When Sydney died, you all convinced yourselves he was this fucking monster kid so that it didn't have to hurt as much. I ain't gonna apologize. Fucking hell, they should. Flynn uncrosses his arms, staring some out of the soul, staring some out of the soul window of the cramped mailroom. Nope. Oh, the cloud cover lifts. I'll be at the front desk. If you take something, always put it back where you found it. He turns, making his way back down the narrow hall. I'm left alone. Everything feels really quiet now. A sort of weird solace amidst the shelves, uh, shelves upon shelves of Echo's history. I rub my face and muzzle, spinning a whisker as the previous conversation plays back in my head and begins to fade like a passing dream. With the slow exhale, I turn and head over to head over to the archives. They all seem to be categorized by numbers like 10566009 or 10721001. I grab a random file off the shelf, 10601001. Flipping it open, I see a cluster of 15 or so papers and permits for a place called Adelaide's Thrift and Pawn. It sounds familiar, and it only takes me a little bit more, per more perusing to figure out why. Near the exit from Route 93 to Flint Road, there's this faded old shack of rotten wood. Growing up, all that was left of the sign out front was Elaide's Thrift. I think it's bulldozed now, though, since I didn't see it on the drive-in. According to these documents, Adelaide Vondenberg applied for and successfully obtained a business license and deed to the property in 1979. I'm guessing these folders corresponded to a piece of property with an echo or a parcel. It helps me some, but I still am not sure exactly where to look. Put the file away and move over to the computer Flynn got ready for me. A screen displays an aerial photograph of Echo, with little polygons drawn over it, like a bizarre checkerboard. Clicking on one, nothing happens. I click again, and the pointer turns into an hourglass, the program stating that it's not responding. Damn it! As the hourglass rolls on the screen, I think I hear the front door open down the hallway. At first, I wonder if it's Carl, but then a voice speaks that I don't recognize. Then Flynn's. I can only make out a little of what he says. That's what they told you at the county office? You could have come here. The hourglass spins. The unincorporation. It shouldn't affect developers who... Like an L? Finally, a little window pops, uh, pops up listing owner. I added listing owner, address, parcel number, links to building plans and other fields. Slow as hell, but this is actually kind of neat, I guess. Curious, I scroll over to the location of my old house and click. This time it reacts a little faster. The complaint forms are physical. Not much of an online presence at... It's currently listed as abandoned and condemned. It looks like the people my parents sold it to ditched it rather quickly. I move back towards the archive, picking up my old house's corresponding file and setting it down on the counter. Opening it, I see a weathered floor plan of my old house dating back to 1986. Nothing here could remotely be considered of interest for my project. However, I put the file back where I found it. As I hear the increasingly quiet rasp of Flynn's voice in the other room, I realize he's probably too busy to hold my hand with regards to where to look. Especially after the previous conversation, it might be best to just give him some space. I stare at the aerial display on the, on the computer monitor, trying to figure out where to start looking. Uh, let's do the mine. There's something about the old mine that feels off to me. Unlike pretty much every locale in Echo, the mine was the one place we absolutely did not play. Sydney tried to make one of our scavenger hunt objectives down in there once, but TJ told his mom about it and that was the end of that. After looking up the parcel number, I retrieved the corresponding file and lay it out on the mail counter. This one has an, archi this one has an archival notice attached to the front. I guess my hunch might be correct, might be right. Opening the file, the first thing I note is that there is a seriously large amount of documents here, and even a laminated old photo. CM 1980. Huh. 
That's a hell of a lot more verdant than it is these days. Might have to do with the dam with the damming they did up north in the 50s. I'm guessing the CM 1915 is referring to the year the photo was taken. But in the folder itself, many of the documents seem to be legal in nature, including documentation about a lawsuit of some sort. The ones on top seem to relate to that tourism program Echo tried a decade ago. There's a few papers about a historical heritage grant and the installation of a bench and two lamps outside the mine's entrance. There's even reference to a large placard installed into the side of the rock face outside. I don't remember ever seeing that. Following this, there's another folder within that contains some condemned notices and a squatter evictions dating from 1970 to 1975. Said folder also notes a work order for the installation of rebar bars in the mine front to prevent entry in 1976. Next, there's the actual lawsuit documentation itself. The lawsuit contributed in part to the official closing of the mine during the war in 1942. The working conditions were abysmal, and the owners of the mine were also heavily involved in town government, so there, was, so there were corruption charges. The Danica Mine, also known as the CSCG, Copper, Silver, Coal, Gold Mine, was the most in-demand employer in the northern portion of the state for decades. This was little in part due to the management by the owners, but rather the natural conditions of the mine itself. The structure of the bedrock kept cave-ins unlikely, and its chemical composition kept the temperature stable and somewhat bearable. Flooding was of a minor concern due to the low water table of the region. In other mines within the store, miners may have, ex may have been expected to stand in two feet of dirty water in 40 degree temperatures all while the threat of a cave-in loomed, amplified with every strike of the sledgehammer. Yet even still, the mine managed to have one of the highest casualty rates for its workers in all the southwest. The suit argues that this was at root due to severe negligence by the owner, Gregory, Br Gregory Briggs. Briggs, yep, okay. Miners were required to buy their own tools, including candles, sledges, picks, stakes, and even dynamite. Their wages, however, were of such little amount that many miners must have been forced to choose between having these tools or the, and their family, being, their family being able to eat that week. Many chose the latter, as most men who moved to Echo did so with the explicit purpose of being able to provide for said families. Briggs operated the mine under constant fear of worker unionization. To assuage this, he hired an incredibly nationally diverse assortment of workers. His rationale, though denied in court, was to ensure that no group of workers spoke the same language, thus reducing the chance of collaboration, for better working conditions or wages. This preventative action was particularly heinous due to the nature of the work itself. Second, y'all. All right, y'all, let's see where we're at. Okay. <clears throat> Communication was crucial, especially in low-light conditions of the lower depths. Despite the language barrier, miners were expected to, to coordinate dangerous group mining procedures. For example, for standard ore extraction, one miner would hold a spike to the mine wall while another, swung the, while another miner swung the sledge toward the spike. With light sources being scarce, this meant that, this meant that the risk of striking the other miner with the sledge was a constant risk and something that... And something that occurred with some frequency. Many miners were crippled from blows to the paws or arms, and then once fired were unable to support their families. This led to several notable starvation incidents within the town. The lawsuit documents also include reference to a brief riot in 1915, where a grisly murder took place within the mines itself. I make sure to write summaries of this all inf of all this information down on a blank sheet of printer paper before putting everything back. It's this sort of crap that makes me glad I live in the age I do now. I don't think I'd make a very good miner. All right, that's that, I guess. Abandoned school. Hmm. After finding the parcel number of the GIS thing, I can't seem to find the corresponding file to it. It's like it doesn't exist in any records here, or it might just be misplaced. I'm going to go with the second theory. Maybe I'll ask Flynn about it later. City Hall. City Hall has a lot of history, and I assume most of the really old stuff isn't on file, but I'd be curious to see what's there regardless. After looking up the parcel number, I retrieved the corresponding file and laid it out on the mail counter. This one has an archival notice attached to the front. That's good. Hopefully that means there's supplemental information in here. Unfortunately, upon, upon opening the file, I see there aren't that many documents. There is, however, a marked photo of some sort of, of some sort wedged between the folder edges. Oh. Whoa. If that is really, if that is really the date of the origin in the, top, in the top right corner, this photo of these guys was taken at City Hall 100 years ago. I look back down the folder, finding a capture note for the image. Sheriff William Adler left in Wins Winsleydale researcher Cliff Tibbetts right at town meeting to discuss Echo, Echo Meseta tribe relations. Adler. I just realized now that that's Janice's last name. Must be a distant relative of hers. The rest of the documents in the folder just seem to insist and just seem to consist of proposed additions and use changes for the building. A lot of them didn't pan out. There's a city government roster here, though, and it lists the historical election results for the town going back to the 20th, early 20th century. 
Surprisingly, Flynn and his aunt aren't the only Moors I see on this list. It's like the Moore family has been involved in public office in some capacity as far back as 1914. Which is doubly surprising, noting the prejudice against reptilians that was pretty heavy back then. There's, the whole, there's this whole negative stereotype about them being evil and controlling the government that persists even today. So it's some so it's pretty weird a family like the Moors manages to keep manages to keep getting elected back when the ignorance levels were much higher. I'd like a note to ask Flynn about it as sensitively as possible. I'd go ahead and put everything back in the folder and return it to the bookshelf. So what next? Carl's mansion. I know enough about Carl's family to know that his house is seriously old. His great great aunt, his great great something or another, and is the town founder after all. The place has been seriously modernized into a more stucco adobe style, but there's some history underneath all that. Growing up, Carl overheard all this and started thinking the place was haunted, and it freaked him out pretty badly. So much so his parents basically begged me to have sleepovers with him during the weekends and even on some weekdays. Not that I minded, of course. Carl had all the video game consoles that were out and his parents brought him, bought M-rated games. I got, to, I got to stay up late with his giant TV blowing up aliens and running over hookers. I remember that he started to become less afraid as time went on, and his parents stopped asking for me to come over as much. So, of course, shitbag younger me told Carl a bunch of stories about a ghost bride who I said I saw standing outside his, his house at midnight. And that's how I got to spend my whole fifth grade summer vacation living at Carl's place. After looking up the parcel number, I retrieved the corresponding file and laid it out on the mail counter. Alright, y'all, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Leave a super thanks. Our tip if you can, it always helps. Yo, I'm... Yo, we are gaining subs way faster than we ever have before, so it looks like I might seriously have 4,000, like it seriously looks like I might have 4,000, uh, 4,000 subs by the end of the year, or even before that, yeah, y'all, it's, guys, keep spreading the word about the channel, about four videos every day, constant entertainment, I've got some things in the works, they're taking a while because of life stuff getting in the way, but y'all rest assured, Drake Wind Gaming is going to become something much bigger over time. Mark my words. But anyway, y'all, I love you all. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.